I'm a, a pediatric psychologist. I'm based in the Nemours Cardiac Center at DuPont Hospital for Children. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about getting over the hurdle and how to feel comfortable starting discussions about emotional health. Next slide. So I'm going to start with a just brief overview of my journey with discussing emotional health um, and then move on to uh, pretty quickly to concrete tips for initiating these conversations. Um, you know, there are some common concerns and barriers that I've heard. So we'll talk a little bit about overcoming those um, and then just spend a few minutes at the end talking about some potential benefits and drawbacks of screening as a way to initiate conversations about emotional health. Um, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions as well. Next slide. So um, I have been embedded within the Nemours Cardiac Center for about 10 years. Um, and in this role, I, um, I do a number of things. But one of them is to support um, patients and families in the inpatient setting. So in this case, it's often um, patients who are getting heart surgery, um, and their parents uh, and sometimes siblings and, and you know some of our patients are, are newborns and so we're not doing a whole lot at that time with the actual patients um, and so a lot of the support is really focused on the parents and I will say in this setting is where I probably learn the most of what works and what doesn't work um, and the importance of being proactive with providing the support and making it part of standard care as opposed to being reactive which doesn't tend to go over as well at least not in this setting. Um, I also um, conduct developmental assessments through our cardiac developmental follow-up program, um, as well as child and family therapy. And a lot of um, what I'm doing in those settings is really child-focused um, in the sense that the child is the one that's the patient. However, um, we always incorporate a focus on the family and on the parents as well, um, whenever possible. So even if the patient is the child, is the child is the patient, um, I'm always taking opportunities to ask how the parents are doing and, and really trying to, um, to support them in that context. And sometimes we actually spend more time on the parents than we do on the child. Um, I'm also a researcher and I, uh, my research focuses on family psychosocial needs specific to congenital heart disease. Um, and I lead efforts to support family emotional health through the National Pediatric Cardiology Quality Improvement Collaborative. We've had a lot of discussions related to this in that collaborative. Next slide. So, you know, I wanted to start with just a kind of a recipe for starting these discussions. I find that I follow the same structure pretty much every time. Um, and that structure is normalize, then ask, then pause. Um, and if you were to follow me around for a day, it would be, uh, it would get very boring and repetitive because I pretty much do the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and so I'll go through, you know, how I do this and, and, and why I do think that it works. Um, next slide. So, I, you know, the goal of much of much of this is to avoid the, the response, I'm fine. Um, we tend to get that response from patients or parents when they don't feel comfortable sharing um, or they don't feel like it's appropriate to share. And um, in most cases, I would say people are not fine, particularly in the settings in which we work. Um, and so I would take that when you're hearing a lot of I'm fines, I would take that as a cue as, you know, there's something that's keeping a parent or a patient from really feeling comfortable sharing. Next slide. So why do we start? Why do I start with normalizing? Um, you know, I think this is so important. Before I ask a question about emotional health, I want to first just communicate that emotional difficulties are totally common and totally expected in this situation. Um, I usually do that by referring to what other parents have told me or what I've learned from other patients to really, again, just kind of drive home that like, I'm hearing from everybody that this is a concern. Um, I try to set up the discussion so that the easy answer is to acknowledge emotional difficulties and it actually takes more effort to say, no, actually, that's not what I'm feeling. And to try at all costs to minimize the likelihood of getting a I'm fine response. Next slide. So I, in, in each of these, I put some example, um, and, I, and I'm totally happy to have you guys share these slides if that would be helpful, but just some example um, ways that I might phrase this. And again, I always start the conversation with normalizing. So I might start this conversation as, you know, I, if I'm talking to a teenager, you know, I know from working with other teens that it's really common to feel down or depressed when a certain stressor happens. Um, or many parents tell me that, you know, having a child diagnosed with a congenital heart defect makes everyone in the family feel more anxious. Or I hear from a lot of parents that they've had to grieve the loss of that you know, idea of the normal child. 
Um, and, and you can see the diff like the similarities in all of this. And this is why I'm saying you'd get really bored if you just listen to me talk with patients all day, because they're all the same, which is basically that I learned this thing from working with other parents or patients, or I've heard this, or um, people have told me. Um, and again, kind of putting the expertise back on the patients or the parents, right? I, I don't have the lived experience um, in many cases in what, in what they're going through. Um, and so it's really the patients and the parents that are the experts and they're the ones with the lived experience. But as somebody who works with them, you know, all day for 10 years, I have learned a lot from patients and parents and this is what they tell me. I don't say all that, but that's kind of the background. Um, I also phrase my opening, even when I first walk up to a family, particularly in the inpatient setting, um, cause they're not always expecting to have a psychologist walk up to them that, you know, this is just part of standard care. We always meet with families who are here for their child's heart surgery. You know, or part of our care is to um, ask about these things because we know how important, you know, emotions are to how you're doing um, or how you're doing emotionally is as important as how you're doing physically. So again, like phrasing that conversation in a way that totally normalizes, not only that it's okay to have those feelings and it's normal, but actually that what you're doing is not because anybody kind of told on them because they were caught crying. Um, or something like that, and that this is really just a normal thing that we do. Um, and I and I want to bring that up because when I first started my job ten years ago, we had a different model. Um, we had the model where in the inpatient setting, I would get a call from a nurse who would say, "Hey, it seems like mom's really struggling, or dad seemed really angry today, or I saw mom crying. Can you come and talk to this family?" Um, it never went well because I think the family felt like they were being targeted. Um, somebody caught them crying or caught them getting angry and now the psychologist shows up. Um, and so it's so much more effective to just take a preventative approach, take a universal approach and say, this is just what we do with everybody. It's not because of anything. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that's really important um, to, uh, to incorporate into care. Uh, next slide. So the next step ask. Um, that's obvious. Uh, but I think what's really important is that the, the ask, it has to be open-ended. So we, we need to avoid questions where there's a yes or no answer, because in most cases, the easy answer or the right answer um, the, from the parent's perspective is no, I don't feel that way. Um, and so I'll start with normalizing, you know, many people tell me this, or I've heard that it's, you know, very, that this can be very difficult. And then I'll just ask, you know, how about you? Um, Avoid checklist-like questions. It can be easier to just go through a checklist and you're not really looking for a response or the parent doesn't feel like they really, you really wanna know the response. I think that's really common in medicine. Um, and really less is more. One really good open-ended question means a lot more than 10 checklist questions. Pay attention to your nonverbal communication. Um, you can communicate a lot in eye contact, in what direction you're facing, and if you're leaning forward. Um, if you're sitting still, as opposed to kind of fidgeting and kind of doing other things, if you're facing your computer. Um, and so, you know, you're more likely to get a response that's positive from the family or from the patient if you're actually attending. Um, and, and I see a comment of sitting versus standing. And I think that that's really a great point. You know, sit down. How are you? How are things going? Next slide. So here are some questions that I might ask. I noticed that these all start with how. I do ask a lot of how questions, but I also, you can start them with what. Um, so, you know, many people tell me this, how about you? How about your family? Um, I like to ask questions where it's just assumed that they have experienced something because again, it's normal and common. Um, and if they haven't, they'll tell you, um, it, there's less of a risk of, I think having a parent have to say, oh, I haven't experienced that. than there is a parent saying, or a patient saying, you know, no, I don't feel this way because you've asked it in a way that's close ended. Um, so I'll usually ask, you know, How's your family been affected by this? I hear this a lot. How's this been for your family? Or how has this stressor been for you? Um, again, assuming that there is that stressor and that it has impacted them. Um, and then if they feel like it hasn't, they'll say, yeah, you know, that really hasn't been an issue for us. And, you know, there, there's really no harm done there. Uh, next slide. Uh, pausing. This is really important. Um, it sounds simple, but it's actually not. I think, you know, I'm very fast paced um, and I have to remember that number one, not everyone is as fast paced as I am. Not everyone talks or thinks as fast as I do. Um, second of all, I think what's really, really important is that by pausing and looking at them, you communicate that you actually want to hear the answer. The other thing to keep in mind is that 
you know, the, the patient or the parent didn't come in today, in most cases, expecting to be asked this question and planning to share. Um, and so they might need a minute to kind of gather their thoughts, figure out how to say it, figure out if they want to share, what are the consequences of sharing? Um, what are the good things about sharing? That takes a minute to think about. This might've been the first time they've ever been asked this in a way that's really meaningful, where they've really had the opportunity um, in, a, in a clinical setting. Um, and so, you know, again, assume that they didn't come in expecting to answer this question and they might just need a minute. And if they don't answer it this time and they say, no, I'm fine, that's okay. You know, that, try again next time. That doesn't mean that you don't ask again in six months or in another month. Now they know that this is something that they can talk about. They may go home and think about it and they might come back to the next appointment kind of wanting to share some of this stuff or at least a little more prepared next time. Next slide. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, a conversation that I might have. Um, so, and I noticed down here, I say patient, I actually mean parent. So I apologize for that error. But um, I might say, you know, I hear that a lot of parents, I hear from a lot of parents that they've had to grieve the loss of a healthy child when their baby was diagnosed with a congenital heart disease. How's that been for you? So again, I'm not saying, did you experience this? Um, or I'm not just saying, how are you with no context? Um, I'm saying, how's that been for you? Assuming that they've experienced this. Um, and the parent might say, yeah, actually, it's been really hard. I've definitely gone through that. Um, and then I might say, you know, sometimes it helps to talk to others who've been through it. You know, who have you been able to talk to about this, if anyone? I like to ask, um, I always like to add if, if anyone or if anything to the end, if I'm asking a question like this, because I don't want to assume that they have anyone to talk to or that they have any supports. Um, and it's okay to not have any, and that's okay for them to admit as well. Um, so then the parent might say, you know, I did talk to another parent when we first found out that my child had a heart problem, but I haven't talked to her in a while. Um, and then I can kind of loop back around and say, do you think this might be helpful to reach out again? You know, I know adjusting to this diagnosis is so tough and it may be helpful to hear that others have had the same feelings and what helped them get through it. So I think there, again, I'm bringing it back to this is normal, this is common, this is the support that it sounds like is potentially available to this parent that they haven't utilized in a while. Do you think that reaching out might be helpful? Um, that whole conversation can happen in like two minutes, right? It doesn't take a lot of time. I'm not, you know, most of you, I would imagine, I don't know all of your backgrounds, I'd imagine you're not all psychologists or social workers, maybe some of you are social workers, um, but your primary purpose is not to, you know, do a therapy session for 45 minutes like it is for me. Um, and so it's not expected that you're going to spend 20 minutes on this conversation, but what's important is you normalize, you ask an open-ended question, you pause to hear the answer, and then, you know, reflect, validate, normalize, and tie it back to what supports do they have available? You know, what can they do that might be helpful? Uh, next slide. So, I, you know, I'm going to go into some common concerns that I've heard, um, and I'd love to hear, you know, all of your thoughts as well. Um, so, you know, I'm going to open a Pandora's box. I think this is a very common concern. Um, and I guess what I would say to this is, I can't guarantee this will never happen. Certainly, there's going to be those parents or patients who just, you know, are just open up and they just don't stop talking. And in that case, um, you know, we've all been there. Um, I think in that case, you do need to think about, you know, how much time you have and um, what's your schedule like that day? And can you get, can you spend, you know, an hour with this family? Probably not. So uh, reflect, summarize, talk about supports or, or think about, you know, is there anyone that you can connect them with that could spend longer with them on this topic? Um, and then, uh, you know, kind of uh, redirect in a way that is respectful, thank them for sharing. Um, and so, you know, having a plan for what are you going to do if somebody starts sharing to such an extent that it, you know, it's sort of beyond the scope of what you're able to do in that clinic visit. Um, I'm not saying that will never happen, but I think it's actually very rare. Um, my experience in the research that I've done, and I do, I've done a study on um, parents perceived barriers to actually talking about their own mental health with their child's providers. Um, and there are so many barriers to, um, to parents actually opening up. And, and what you get is likely the very tip of the iceberg. Um, and, you know, parents are not going to share everything because they don't know that it's appropriate. They don't know that if they do share everything that they're going to be able to kind of pull themselves back together. 
Um, they're, they don't know that this is, you know, the right setting. They don't, they think they're going to be judged. There's so many reasons. Um, and so um, as a psychologist, and I know social workers have the same experience, um, you know, we're trying to get that information and it requires a lot of work actually in most cases in those settings. And, um, you know, I think if anything, it's the opposite, which is that parents don't share as much as they're experiencing rather than the other way around related to a lot of those barriers. Um, you know, if a parent is sharing a lot and I need to, and we need to kind of tie it up um, and, and kind of move on to the next topic, um, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll reflect, I'll validate, I'll kind of summarize. Um, it sounds like things have been really tough. What's been helpful in getting through this, if anything? And again, I add the if anything, because maybe there's been nothing and that's okay. Um, or I might say, I'm so sorry to hear that things have been so difficult. You know, I really appreciate you sharing this with me. Um, you know, we have a social worker who meets with many of our families to talk about supports that may be helpful. Would you be open to meeting with him or meeting with her? Um, again, I'm sort of normalizing that, you know, whenever I talk about a resource like that, I always say many of our families meet with this person to normalize it. Um, if you don't have someone like that at your center, um, then, um, you know, think about are there any resources in the community that you can refer them to? And if not, um, let them know that you want to talk about it again at the next session. Um, and that you really appreciate them, you know, talking with you about it. Next slide. So, I, you know, I hear from people that one of the concerns is that they don't have all the answers or, or the resources. Um, and I just want to remind you that asking and listening is an intervention in itself. Um, and that that is the intervention. So that communicates that what they're feeling is normal. Um, and your reaction in that situation and other providers' reactions either reinforces that it's safe to talk about this and that it's okay to talk about this, um, and that that actually can open up the parent or patient's ability to talk about it in other relationships in their life. You know, they might go home and say, huh, that wasn't actually so bad, or I talked about this thing that's really hard for me that I haven't wanted to admit, and, you know, I actually got a kind of positive response. Now I'm going to talk to more people about it. Um, kind of gotten over that hump. Or alternatively, if they get a reaction that's kind of, you know, they feel judged or they feel that it's sort of a not a safe environment to be bringing these things up or that the provider seems really uncomfortable, um, then parents or patients may be less likely to talk about this in future interactions, um, both in the hospital setting or in the clinic setting, but also even outside. Um, and, and you know, the other thing to keep in mind, and I think this is not this is not a good thing, but this is really a fact is that many patients and parents won't access formal mental health services even when they are available. Um, there's so many barriers, you know, there's financial barriers, insurance barriers, wait lists, um, childcare, transportation, and we, you know, and, and as a psychologist, I know social workers do the same thing, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to get parents and patients to actually go to therapy or get mental health services. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but what you can provide is potentially the intervention that they are going to get. Because even if you had all the resources, that doesn't mean that they're actually gonna go and get those, those services. Um, and then, you know, consider who may have information about resources if you, know, if you don't and offer to make this connection. So is there a social worker that you can connect them with? Is there a psychologist? Is there a community organization? Um, nobody expects you to have all the answers. None of us have all the answers for everything. Next slide. Uh, parents often or patients say, or sorry, providers um, will often say that they don't know how to respond. Um, and I think, you know, it, you don't need to have the exact perfect response. I think just, you know, reflect what they're saying, normalize, you can never go wrong with that. Um, I would, tr I would encourage you to avoid trying to cheer them up. Because um, I think that that, although it comes from a good place, it, it can communicate that um, it's sort of not okay to feel sad, or there's something not normal about it. And so like, you know, or I need to help cheer you up so you don't feel this this way. Um, it's also not ideal to talk about strength. I think that, again, that comes from a good place, but I think when parents hear or patients hear over and over again, you're so strong, you know, um, you know, what doesn't break you makes you stronger, all, the, all those little slogans, um, it, it kind of communicates that they have to be strong and when they don't feel strong, that there's something wrong with them. Um, it is also, it also communicates that, or it's also important to communicate that it's okay to talk about this. It's okay to show emotion. Um, thank, thank people for sharing, you know, that, that's really a privilege that someone felt comfortable sharing with you. Um, ask about available supports. 
um, that they may have access to. It doesn't necessarily need to be professional mental health support, but peer support, family support, friends, um, and if possible, connect them with someone who has information about resources, if available, if you think that would be helpful. Next slide. Um, I'll feel awkward. You know, that's another common one. I don't really know how to ask this question. I'm going to feel kind of awkward having this conversation. What I would say to this is, you know, again, nobody expects, if, if you're not a mental health professional, nobody expects you to be one. Um, but I do think that everyone expects you to be human. Um, and we all have these conversations uh, with our friends and family, right? Most of us are probably asking our friends and family how they are genuinely and, and actually wanting to know. Um, and so I would just kind of treat this the same way. Um, you know, don't overthink it. Um, it's not that it's not actually that complicated. It's it's just kind of a human um, interaction of how are you doing? This is tough. You know, how are you guys holding up? Um, and the, the earlier you can start in the relationship, the better, because, um, again, that sort of implies that um, this is a normal part of care um, and patients and parents will come to expect it versus out of the blue all of a sudden kind of like starting this scripted conversation. Next slide. Okay, so, you know, I think screening is an awesome tool. It's an important tool, um, but I would not um, say that it is the only tool, and I don't think that it's something that should be done as a first step. Um, I think it's a very helpful addition to informal discussion, but it's just one piece of a larger model of care that emphasizes emotional health um, and, and really should be a later step of the process. So it really can't replace the informal discussion. And the reason I say this is that Number one, if you've never had a conversation about emotional health, and then all of a sudden you're like handing someone a screening tool, um, it can seem a little bit kind of off-putting, like, well, what is this information? You know, why am I being asked this? Where is this going? Um, I also think, you know, when you're asking questions about specific mental health symptoms, um, you have a, even a greater obligation to follow up on those than if you're having an informal conversation. Um, and so it's really important that you have those referral processes in place if you're going to screen, and that if a parent takes the time to fill out a screener or a patient takes the time, that you're actually going to connect them with the help that they need um, in response to that screener. Otherwise, it's just not ethical. Um, but again, I would say screening is a terrific tool um, once you have those other supports in place and once you've kind of become comfortable having those discussions about emotional health, just as part of standard care. Next slide. 